I'm going to talk about value numbering in GCC, covering work I've done, I think, four or five years ago, but I haven't yet talked about it. Uh, so, first, what is volume, value numbering? Uh, value numbering is the task of assigning values, value IDs to expressions to be able to identify multiple expressions as computing the same value. That's, for example, used in common sub-expression elimination. Right? So expressions that produce the same value, they should have ideally the same value number. Um, the process of assigning the value number can be very easy if the, if the expression is even syntactically equivalent or can be more difficult if it's a variation, like if you have a value multiplied by two or the value added to itself. Ideally, you would like to assign the same value number to those expressions, but it's of course more difficult to do that if they are not syntactically equivalent. And usually um, implementations use a form of hashing to um, equate the, those expressions and before actually hashing a new expression, you, they uh, replace all operands by their value number so that you basically have expressions of values which you then assign either an existing or a new value number. So in GCC, we of course have a very many value numbers. And as I wasn't there when GCC was invented originally, but only joined like a few years later, and let me see, a wild guess might be 15 years later, could, could match uh, kind of that. At, at that point, we at least had the, the CSE lib, um, which is used by RTL, CSE, but also some other passes in the RTL pipeline, for example, um, bar tracking and let's uh, give the pending question. Yeah. Uh, I, I think RTL SSE actually does not use SSE lib. It's used by other all other places in RTL, but not not in CSE. CSE. Yeah, it, it has its own hashing. Also, oh, so, so it, uh, yeah, okay. So, 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 what's the what's the main user of CSE lib then, apart from wild tracking? If you, if you remember, I don't know. I, I know about wild tracking okay. because that's I cared about. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I checked, and RTL PRE is also not using CSE lib, but it's basically just using hash RTX and RTX equal, which is then probably also what CSE does plus some enhancements. Uh, so I was wrong, the slides are wrong. Um, and then at, at some point later when I already was uh, working on GCC, we had uh, Gimple and SSA. And on Gimple SSA we have at least two main value number. One is implemented in the dominator optimization path it's now uh, even abstracted into a separate file, at least, with some class thing. So C++, you know. Uh, it's called scoped trees there. It's basically the, uh, the expression hashing and equality implementation of the dominator optimization, uh, expression equivalence tracking and uh, redundancy removal. And then we have the other value numbering that's used by the full and partial redundancy elimination passes. So full redundancy elimination is basically common sub-expression elimination. So it's, this, it's a different term for, for the same thing. Um, and that's now since GCC 9. Uh, the, it's a, a reverse post order, order walk based value numbering and previously there were two other ways of doing the value numbering before the current implementation. Uh, and then of course you could say 
um, we have more passes doing kind of value numbering, even if they don't really assign value IDs or value numbers to expressions. That's like uh, constant propagation, where um, the constants itself are the values. And you substitute them everywhere, uh, you simplify, and if there's a new magic constant coming out of the expression, then you have a new value. So it's also kind of a value numbering with just constant values. Or you have copy propagation, which is kind of, uh, it, it's not, not really computing values, but, but the copies are also kind of values, where you basically substitute the, the uh, earliest source of the copy operation into the last destination. So all the intermediate registers have the same value as the original copy. So how does common sub-expression work, uh, common sub-expression elimination work? So for each statement, you, you try to simplify um, the, the expression using the value numbers of the operands, like if some value numbers are actually constants, then like with constant propagation, it can happen that you have a fully constant expression, which you can fully evaluate, or that you have special constants for special operations, like multiplication by one or zero, so that you can simplify the, the operation. Uh, after you've simplified the expression, you try to look up the expression in your uh, table of, of existing expressions you've already seen, to see if it's equivalent to an already seen expression and you can use the same value number as the already seen one. And if you don't, uh, if, if, you, if you couldn't find the, the value in the table of existing expressions, you assign a new value number, right? And, um, you, um, and for the, the actual elimination of the common sub-expression, when you find an already existing value, then re you replace the later expression with a register that's known to hold this value, for which you need to track the basically availability of values in registers or where they are available else, like constants are always available, depending on what your intermediate language provides. So, and if you do not find the expression, then uh, you, you, you invent a new value number and record the destination of the expression as the register where that value is available for later uses if you find them. So, um, and a few words about availability. There are actually different ways to track an update or query the availability. For example, the dominator optimization pass uh, can, can just keep a one-to-one -one map of, uh, available, um, of available, of available, can track, use a map from, from uh, the, the value to the, the SSA name, where the, the SSA name is available during the dominator walk. And uh, when unwinding from the dominator walk, it can just basically use, use an undo stack to, to restore the operation, uh, to restore the uh, availability state. Um, the, the, uh, value numbering based on the re reverse post order walk um, does it a little bit different because there's no no easy way to to implement the unwinding step you can you can do with the dominator walk instead it records a list of um, leaders so re registers that are where a value is available and to, together with that, where uh, that leader is actually, yeah, so it, it records that list. And, and of course it has, when it then queries availability, it has to, from this list, pick uh, one of the candidates that's actually available at the point where the query is. And it uses a dominator checks for that. Uh, the, the reason why it's, that 
that complicated is because the reverse post, post order value numbering um, also allows optimistic iteration, which means it needs to unwind some of its state. And the, this way, having a, a list of uh, leaders per value, it, it's very easy to unwind that by just stripping off the, 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 the leaders produced uh, up to the, the iteration point. So there's, there's one, one other way for availability, like the, the partial redundancy elimination path for its data flow problem uh, to compute the uh, anticipability. Uh, it, it actually has bitmaps of uh, values that are available for each basic block, which basically it, it, it needs quadrat quadratic uh, memory because every value that's available in a block that uh, dominates any other block is also available in, in, the, in the later block. And so it basically uses a quadrat quadratic amount of memory, which is sometimes a, a problem. So the uh, new reverse post order value numbering um, is, is specifically also using uh, these uh, available expressions when simplifying the expressions of values. Um, because if you like have two um, equivalent expressions, it can matter which of the actual available register you use when you simplify because in, in our Gimple SSA, we have at e, for each register attached information like a value range. And so even for two syntactically equivalent expressions that are computed at different points in the CFG, um, they, they can actually be different, differently constrained due to uh, conditionals, con conditions they uh, are dominated by, right? So it, it actually matters if you like throw generic fold or match PD rules onto an expression, which of the, of the available registers you use as operands, because of, if you pick up one with the wrong range, you possibly perform a, a, a wrong simplification. So that means before the RPO CSE, does expression simplification, it substitutes um, available leaders into all the operands to avoid this issue. So the old implementation just cleared all the, uh, the flow sensitive information on all SSA names before well, do it performing the value numbering and restored it afterwards. <coughs> yes? Presumably, you're afraid of losing information of you if you take one or the other SSA, right? With regards to ranges? So if you, if you get the wrong range, you get wrong code. Can you union them? Because now we have a way, yeah. we have fine grain ranges in the global space right well, now. Well, if you, if you would, you could probably union all of the available information, but then you have to walk through all of them, right? So if you have two instances of the same expression, where one operand for one expression is like always positive and on the other side it's always negative because you have a condition which right. just tests that and you do the simplification and it says, well, for negative values, this is always zero because it's undefined or whatever. And you are actually simplifying the other expression, but in, in the expression hash table where the expression exists only once with the, with the actual value numbers as operands, but it then uh, it of course it matters which of the expressions you simplify because we, <coughs> we have a way of well not only union them but yeah. any expression we have ways of, of folding the expression without the overhead of the ranger or gory anything there's the range up tables you can take an expression and you yeah. can do the operation on the ranges if that helps so so possibly if we were to find all the leaders of a value we could compute the union of this kind of information and produce basically a, a master value range. 
That's, but that's probably effectively what the original implementation does, drop to varying, right? So the, the, the advantage of the, the new approach is that we can actually use the correct range information when simplifying, if it's there. And we are not generating wrong code if we happen to pick the wrong one. So the old implementation generated wrong code, which is why we then uh, resorted to clearing all of the information. So yeah, I already said everything on the slide. So this, the same uh, applies to, um, on, on the points to info, we now have the non-zero, which is uh, used at, at some points that's now also flow sensitive. So there's, there's more and more information that's flow sensitive that's attached to SSA names. So it's, it's, it was problematic in general to basically just use random representatives for the operands um, and, and not those that are valid at the program point, you're actually simplifying the expression. Yeah, uh, now, um, all of what I said before for syntactical equivalent expressions and assigning the same value number to them is a little bit more complicated when there's memory involved. Because, of course, a load of A is not the same as a load of A if you have them do them at different program points because there might be other statements in between that modify A, right? With the nice thing about SSA form is that if two SSA uh, variables appear in an expression, you know they have the same value, right? Because it's SSA. But with memory, that doesn't work. Um, so on Gimple, actually, we, we, we try to have also kind of SSA for memory, but we don't have it for the actual memory locations, but only for the global memory state. So basically, each time the global memory state is modified, we assign a new SSA name to the global memory state. So that is, we have a single uh, underlying variable, the dot mem variable, that represents, represents the memory state, and we write that into SSA. So for this example above, you can see we store um, zero to the A member of the object P points to, one into the B member, and then we do an aggregate copy of the aggregate into a different variable and then load from the A member again. You see the two stores introduce new uh, SSA definitions and actually record which of the memory state SSA variables is, if, is in effect before the statement and the definition describes the memory state after the statement, right? So how does um, value numbering work in, 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 in that case? So the, the most simplistic thing is uh, in addition to the expression, which would be, for example, for the last load, just x.a, uh, also uh, factor in the, the current memory state, right? So the expression is not only x.a, but it's x.a at dot mem5. And then hash that and see if you have another x.a at mem5, uh, okay, they would be equivalent and then we can assign the same value number to that. <coughs> of course, that's very simplistic. And it doesn't get us very far, but it probably would help in some cases already. Um, instead, what we do is we basically query, do we have x.a uh, at memory state five? And it's, well, no, we don't, okay. Then let's try follow the use def chain of the mems. Uh, from the version five, we get to the store of x, the aggregate copy. And at that point, we see, oh, well, we modify x. So we, we, we can't trivially look further, but we have some magic in the value numbering, which can then see, ah, maybe I can rewrite the expression I'm looking up, the x.a, in terms 
of the right-hand side of this copy. And so we continue looking for uh, the A member of the object P points to. And we are using the memory state mem4 for that. And then we arrive at, oh, we, we don't have it in the hash table, so we, we walk one step further, we arrive at the store of uh, B of the object P points to. And we see, well, that doesn't alias what we are looking for, so we can just skip to the next statement. So then we look for P uh, dash A at memory state three, and then we can actually find that because when we visited the first store, we have inserted that into the hash table and assigned a value number to it. So right, that, that looks quite expensive, and it actually is. <laughs> So that's basically where, in, in, in regular programs, 80% of the CSE time is spent in this kind of walking the program to find memory redundancies. But of course, those are the most important to optimize. <coughs> so for example, the, the dominator optimization, CSE, has a neat trick here it actually records the x dot a in, into the, so it doesn't work for this example, but imagine the, the store would be also to x dot a at the very top and not via the aggregate copy. But it, it records the x dot a into the hash table and at lookup time, even if there are intermediate statements that possibly clobber things, it will find that and the memory state that was associated with it so it knows, oh, there is something, so it's worth doing the walk. And it basically just verifies, is that a correct answer? That's kind of clever, but it breaks down once you support the fancy things like the aggregate copy, because, because. But it's still on like the to-do list. Try to do something like that, also for the complicated thing. Yeah, well, the obvious improvement would be to record stuff also on the, when you see an aggregate copy, right? You would then walk through all expressions that are available for the dereferenced right-hand side and optimistically record something also for the left-hand side. Then you, would, yeah. then you would find it earlier, but that, of course, comes at the expense of memory because your hash tables yeah. become larger and larger without guarantee that you actually ever look up yeah. whatever you recorded. So that, that's the two. Yeah. Or you can do. So, but we, we are doing this for quite some years now, and um, since since all of the walks like this are, are limited, so we do I think at max walk thousand statements or five hundred. <laughs> so it's constant time. You know, we win. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the trick. You know, you write a paper. It's a uh, constant time value numbering. <laughs> for not too big programs. No. Okay, yeah, that's, that's what I told you already, right? So the, the, there are the list of the fancy tricks. The, one of the tricks that was in the example was the, the aggregate copy, but there's of course tricks like if you have um, like a, a memz to some value, and then you have a, a read of just a piece of the memory the memz touched, we can actually basically reinterpret some, some uh, byte sequences as the, the type you are looking up. Or like if there's a mem copy, we can treat it similar to the, to the aggregate copy. Or that's the, I think the most recent uh, improvement there is collecting the value we are looking up. Like for example, imagine you load a vector of integers, uh, but you only have stores that store the individual elements. But we can now pick them all up and produce a vector as the result of the load. That works nicely if it's a constant vector in the end, because then we have a value number by itself. But it's, it, it helps to, to remove abstraction that's, for example, used by Firefox, because they do vectors manually, at least in the that's gated with Am I not LVM? 
Yeah, and as I said, the memory handling consumes all of the compile time of the CSE. So uh, I didn't yet get to motivate why did we re-implement the value numbering methodology again. Um, so the, the, the previous one before the reverse, reverse post author walk based was um, uh, one working on SSCs of SSA, of the SSA graph, which is quite nice because if you have cycles in the SSA graph, the, the iteration that you then perform when you have a, a value numbering that iterates, I will have an example later why that's even a thing, uh, then, then you get the, the minimal set of statements you need to iterate uh, the value numbering on. Um, the difficulty is that if you are working on the SSA graph, um, then it's, it's difficult to exploit things like conditional, um, conditional predicates, conditional equivalences, because it, it doesn't match to the CFG, right? But it's, it's difficult, it's not impossible, because I actually managed to bolt on something like that on the old implementation. But it's a little bit awkward. Um, and so the, the, the main motivation to, to do the rewrite was actually to, to make the whole thing also work on regions of the CFG. Because again, when you work on the SSA graph, it's difficult to map a region of the CFG to a region of the SSA graph, right? Because it, it's just not a natural fit. And of course, there was talks for some years, well, that we need to replace the algorithm with a reverse post order work one. So that, that's another reason, but it's not a good reason usually. So what can this new value numbering now do? So it, it can actually operate in, in different modes for this memory handling, this ex, expensive one. It can actually do this, this very trivial one, not do any walking at all and just use the exact, look for the exact same memory state, right? So then it's, it's quite cheap. Um, it can do the walking, but not the fancy tricks like the, the aggregate copying. So for that case, we could actually implement the same trick as the dominator optimization, which, which might be a good idea. Um, it can do iterating or non-iterating mode. Um, especially when doing the non-iterating mode, it can do uh, all the value numbering and the elimination in a single pass over the statements, which is quite cache friendly in that case. For the, with, in the iterating mode, it basically performs value numbering of the whole function with iteration. And if all the value numbers are found, it needs another pass over the function or, or the region to then do the elimination, which is, well, yeah, so at, you at least have two passes over the IL with the iterative mode in that case. And of course, it can do, it can work on regions, actually single entry and multiple exit regions. In theory, handling multiple entries should be possible, but I'm currently disallowing that because, because because I didn't test it, probably. It's like also the, the region mode currently disallows iteration because I also didn't test it. The, it, it might have bugs to say. So uh, why is this iterating thing? What, what's that about? So the, the, this is the, the classical example. You have a loop that's, I should have put the C code on the side, but I was learning new uh, slides tools and I didn't figure out how to do that. <laughs> um, so it's actually a quite simple example. I will just uh, describe the, the source program with words. It's a loop that will actually not iterate, right? But we don't know yet. So uh, what happens if you do not iterate, uh, then you come from function entry 
and you run into the basic block three, where you have two incoming edges, right? So for the back edge, the back edge value on, on the fee nodes, where, the two, where two SSA versions are merged, you don't know the value of the uh, SSA name on the back edge. So it's still varying, kind of. It's actually top, but in non-iteration mode, you have to treat those as, as, uh, as varying. That means you, you don't know the value of i and well when you enter the loop, which means you don't know if the jump at the end of the loop is taken or not, which means you can't eliminate it. When you are iterating, uh, then you can treat the package as optimistically as not executing. So you can ignore the values from the package and you can constant propagate the, the zeros from the indexation variable. Uh, that's actually the, the important value we have to, to value number here. Right? And then, so if you get further, it, the i1 is zero, then the i7 is two, and n is one. It doesn't actually change. So you know, we know that we will exit the loop. And then we will arrive at a function end and we are done. And we have not made the back edge ex executable and can statically optimize this branch. When we change the example to make the loop actually iterate, right, then we would statically determine that the back edge is taken. And then uh, we see, oh, okay, we're actually going back in our reverse post-order walk with this edge, and then we, we iterate this region of blocks. Basically, we start again and see, oh, now we have a value for i7 and val8, and the edge is executable. We merge it with the original one, and we see, well, merging zero and, and one, yeah, that, that gets us varying, which means we, we, we discard the old value of i1 and have it, it the value, an, a new value number. We are using the SSA name itself for the varying here. And then we can't statically determine the condition anymore. So we need to make the loop exit edge also executable. And finally, value number the rest and well, then we, we know nothing if the loop iterates, even if it iterates exactly twice. Right, so the, this most interesting case oh, is only interesting when the loop doesn't iterate. It doesn't help us if we know it iterates twice or three times. It, was all, it would also help if we know if the loop always iterates and never exits. But, yeah, so actually I think there are not very many cases where the iterative value numbering really helps. But I'm curious if somebody can uh, think of other cases. At least on my, my, my to-do, I should probably try to instrument that and see where it produces something useful. Because iteration is another source of the time sink of the path because it actually scales with loop depth, right? So, like if you have a loop depth of five, you will iterate five times, at least. Because you need one iteration to make a back edge executable. If you have n back edges, you iterate n times. But of course, it's limited to a maximum loop depth, so it's constant time again. So for the, for the outer loops, we then force varying to the loop back edges, and so we don't get the iteration, if, if those beyond the maximum loop depth. So we only iterate the innermost loops, where it's the most interesting thing to discover that it won't iterate. So I have a slide on the iteration scheme, interesting. So yeah, uh, so one one um, important thing for 
for iteration is. So if he had the old uh, value numbering implementation on the SCCs of the SSA graph, it would just iterate until nothing change, changes, basically, right? Uh, for, for each element of the SCC, compute value numbers. And if they are still the same, then you are finished. Um, that's reasonable for the SSA graph thing because the cycles are small. Uh, but with, if you always visit all statements in a basic block, even if you are just interested in, in a few variables, then it's sometimes a little bit excessive. And if you use a, a random reverse post order, so there are many reverse post orders depending on how exactly your depth first walk uh, walks the function, uh, then, then the region of the blocks in your reverse post order you need to iterate can actually be quite large. So the, the, uh, I attempted to optimize this first question. I, I just want to mention that if you remember that the SECs in the SSR graph, well, no, the SECs of the SSR graph were not always small. Uh, with the memory operand, you yeah, basically covered that's, whole loop nests. So the that's, argument... That's true. Uh, for, the, for, for, for the memory, that's true. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still just a part of, the fun, part of the loop and not all statements. Right. Uh, what did I... Yeah. Um, so the first thing was to try to optimize the reverse post order in a way so that the, the consecutive blocks in this reverse post order um, are basically um, are consecutive to form regions of the, the smallest iteration. Uh, so how, how would one say this? Mm. Basically, um, blocks inside of the same loop should be uh, after each other and only then blocks from outside of the loop were visited. So basically when you do the, the depth first walk and if you have the choice to exit the loop or stay in the loop, you exit the loop first. So that's counterintuitive, but you exit the loop first. So and for this, because we have this reverse, right? So, um, but for this, of course, you, you need to know um, whether you're going to exit the loop or not. You can say, well, we have loop information. It, that's true, but uh, there are other kinds of cycles, like the irreducible regions, which our loop structures doesn't cover, but you still, of course, need to value number them. Um, for this, there was a paper, I think, actually Michael found at some point, um, about some new loop discovery thing um, that's now used by this rev post order and mark DFS back ZME function, which is uh, computing this kind of um, reverse post order that's optimized for iteration. And when you ask it to do that, then it first does this kind of loop computation. So it performs two DFS walks in that case. And it also um, can compute the, post, the reverse post order of a region of the CFG, which is important if you try to limit the compile time to the region size, basically, to be in the order of the region size. Um, yeah, so, and uh, the, the actual value numbering, it, it doesn't actually iterate until nothing changes, but it tries to anticipate if if we were iterating, if any value would change. And the obvious candidate is, of course, to look only at the, the, the fee nodes of, uh, at the fee nodes in the destination of the back edge. And if, if you can compute whether the values of those will change, then you know, of course, there could be downstream changes. And if you can compute that they don't change, then you can say, can you, you can say they won't change. And that works actually quite well, but it's a little bit more complicated than I said, because it's always details. 
um, uh, you can look into the implementation if you like. Um, so to optimize the cost, it was um, important to, to design all the data structures in a way that we can actually unwind to the block we, we are restarting the iteration from. Um, for the value numbering, what you actually unwind is the hash table contents because you might have inserted expressions that are not uh, valid or that are basically wrongly optimized. Um, and the, the availability, because you're, yeah, you're basically, the availability needs to track the, the state of the iteration. And, but the, the, the values, they are kept the same. So basically, you could also iterate until nothing changes on the, uh, in the value table. Um, yeah, so, and so the, the data structures are implemented in a way uh, that, that the cost of the unwind to the iteration start, to the iteration restart point is of the order of the, the size of the iteration, basically, of the work done for, uh, from the last iteration. And I already said, the dependence on the loop depth. But yeah, and so we are iterating the inner cycles before iterating the outer cycles. One could also try to always iterate the biggest cycle, but that was actually slower in, in, pract in practice on CC1 files, which is everything that matters for writing papers because spec 2000 is no longer a thing. So the, the more interesting uh, mode, at least for the, the original purpose of the value numbering is the, the non-iterative mode, uh, because that's what you want to use when you're um, doing the CSE on a region, like we are now doing in, in many places. I have a slide on that. Um, and that's basically doing a greedy walk from the anterior edge, doing the value numbering, doing the elimination, and at each control statement, um, determine, can I statically determine the branch or not? And basically all edges that might be executables are then queued into a work list and we pick from that in the reverse post order to produce the optimal result. And <clears throat> so, as I said <clears throat> in the example, uh, the um, package values we have to consider uh, varying because we, we didn't yet compute a value number for them, from them when we are not iterating. And so we have to be conservative on them, which means we, compared to the iterative mode, we might miss some of the optimizations. But if you have like um, CFG merges, those fees, fee nodes are of course uh, used optimally even. So when you statically determine a condition always going to through the true edge and then you reach a CFG merge after that, uh, we can still ignore the, the known not taken incoming edge from the, from the other fee argument. So the, the, one of the main uh, reasons of the, the rewrite was that we kind of needed more and more places where we want to perform some kind of scalar cleanup, uh, like after loop unrolling, after some high level loop transform that doesn't also want to deal with uh, replacing all the redundancies in, in data references. Um, and so we you know, accumulated quite a number of places where we do CSE on a region, basically on some pass applies a transform, and on this region we then apply, well, CSE, clean things up. And the, the first use was on loop unrolling, where the, the loop unrolling pass starts with unrolling the inner loop, the innermost loop of a loop nest, and then if that's completely unrolled, 
sees, <coughs> is it profitable to also unroll the outer loop? And if you don't clean up the unrolled code, then all the size estimation is, of course, slightly off. So the fix is, well, run CSE on, on the unrolled body. Then you have nicer code, which you can just do statement counting and apply your limits to. And then you get much better heuristics for whether you want to do outer loop unrolling or not. So the, the last edition was, I think, the, the early uninit analysis. You now uses the uh, RPO value numbering to compute reachability on, in the unoptimized code. So it's basically only for O0, but it only computes the value numbers for that. So it doesn't do any, any elimination because it's O0, it shouldn't optimize, right? And it can do that, and, and the only output that's used currently is basically the, the state, the executable state of the edges that allows to avoid diagnostics in dead code and also avoids, uh, also allows it to diagnose more cases that were previously not diagnosed because they were conditional, but they are not really conditional in real. And of course, you know, C++, lots of abstraction and templates and yeah, the, the, the code that's fed into the early unended analysis is kind of big most of the times. But yeah, so the, the value numbering doesn't yet do inlining, so it doesn't help that much for the abstraction, but it helps a little bit. And that's actually the, the API that you can use to perform value numbering or common sub-expression elimination on uh, a region of the CFG. First, you need to specify the CFG, that's basically the, the function. Uh, an entry edge, and you have a bitmap of basic blocks you exit to. So that's not the basic blocks where the exit ed edge um, starts, but where it ends. Because uh, basic blocks of edges, uh, bitmaps of edges are kind of not possible. This is why I use the blocks we exit to. It works nicely. Uh, and you, you can specify the mode, whether you want the iterative mode, whether you want to perform the elimination, and how much effort you want to uh, do on the memory. Right? We have the, the simplistic, this is the no walk. We have the walk, that's basically what the dominator optimization does. Just skip the non-aliasing statements and look for exact matches. And then we have fancy, it's called walk rewrite which does the fancy stuff as well. And then as, as part of the development, the, the, there is now also these, this RPO compute thing that works on, on a region, and that also marks DFS edges on, on the fly because we are doing the DFS work anyway, and then you know the back edges are those that actually correspond to the DFS work that specified the, RP, the, the reverse post order and not some other back edges in, in, irredu in irreducible regions that might actually matter that we perform the same DFS work. Um, and uh, also as part of making this basically constrained to uh, complexity of the region size, there is now the auto basic block flag and auto edge flag where you can allocate bits of the uh, edge and basic block flex bitmap, so the, the integer that's there in the data structure, where there's, for example, the edge DFS back uh, statically allocated bit. And that, with that, you can, for example, replace uh, things like the S bitmap that's used in the, in the other RPO compute function, which, of course, has an initialization time that's at the order of the function size and not the region size. And it's also quite cache friendly because you're testing the flex of the edges and blocks anyway, or at least the numbers because those are near to them. So it's, it works quite nicely. The, the only 
disadvantage is that you have to clear all the flags before you finish. So a little bit about uh, efficiency. So that the startup cost should be linear in the size of the region you process. And if you do the no walk um, memory thing um, and not do elimination, then uh, I have actually done the measurements on CC1 files uh, by instrumenting the full redundancy pass to first perform the region thing on each individual basic block um, compared to doing the same analysis on the whole function. So that was the only thing I could come up with that compares apples and apples. Because once you do any elimination, you then compare, well, already eliminated. So it's, yeah. And then if you use, uh, look at the CC1 files, you get an overhead of 15%, which isn't too bad, I think. So it's basically, um, it's, it says that the, 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 ex, the startup cost and the cost of, yeah, basically, it's, it's not existent or it's very slow. It, it's very low. Um, there's, there's one outlier, which is the instant utter tab, which has very many empty basic blocks, which um, is 280% slower because, of course, for the empty basic blocks, it's totally only the initialization overhead. It's, it's of course there because we do something, right? We allocate memory, we compute the reverse post order of the single basic block because I obviously didn't optimize for the single basic block case. So it's, it's quite okay. Um, when you do not the no walk memory handling, but the normal walk, you can't really compare this anymore because the, the single basic block value numbering will stop the walking at the boundary of the region, but the whole function thing will go very much up. So it will have, it will be a lot cheaper to do the pair, pair basic block operation in that case than the whole function thing, which is of course backwards. But it would also catch more optimization in theory. Right, so uh, w what this tells us is that when you have some high level transform and you think, well, we should do scalar cleanup afterwards, then it's a good idea to not schedule another full redundancy elimination pass after that pass, but instead run the region-based CSE on the, like the loop you transformed, or maybe get also the pre-header block into it and the exit block, so you can enlarge it slightly to, to, to get some more opportunities. Do that, even if you think, oh, but what happens when I have a loop uh, function with very many loops and I do this very many times? So that shouldn't be an issue in practice, right? And it's still a lot better because usually your high level transform doesn't trigger on all of the loops. So there's, there's one thing missing, of course, in the scalar cleanup uh, when you do common sub expression elimination. Um, it actually does perform uh, removal of the no longer needed statements, um, including rematerializing um, values it removed on, on the exit edge, because not all users can always be replaced in region-based mode, because I, I'm not replacing outside of the region. So it, 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 it can happen that uh, the region-based CSE will insert copies on that edge for that reason, because I didn't replace everything. Um, and yeah, yeah, so what's missing is uh, basically that code elimination. There we have some work list-based simple D DCE, but you need some seed SSA names for that to work. And uh, that store elimination is also, also not uh, available uh, region aware. So those would be two things to tackle for the true scalar cleanup, right? Um, yeah, so the, the, the new reverse post order 
um, CSE has kind of, so, so the, the code says it's predicated values, but so it's, it's basically a, a, um, a hack to, to have relations doing the value numbering. So basically what, what Ranger now can do um, to, if, if you have um, a, a comparison, I is less than, than J, and later you have a, a check, is I less or equal than J, then value numbering can, via this predication, figure out that uh, the, the later condition is true. It basically, it does that by, by inserting on, 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 on the edge into the expression hashes uh, the value for i is smaller than j with the value true, right? And, and at the conditions, it looks up. Do I have an expression for i is less than or equal j? And it will find one of these with the corresponding value. And like just an abstract, you know, x and y. You could just use the the, the relational oracle we use, and you don't need to bring in the full ranger if that helps in any way. You know, the path where x is greater than y, and then you ask if x is greater than or equal to y, you can do that without the full use of the ranger with just the relational oracle. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, it's, it's basically on the list to see how ranger can be used there. So it's, it's, it's mostly an, an issue only for the very first uh, full redundancy elimination pass because afterwards we have the value range propagation which will optimize all these. So it's basically to get as much optimized early as possible. Um, and originally we didn't have the capability, so it was really required. So one idea is to just kick it out again. And the other idea is to see what we can leverage. I think for, for the non-iterating non uh, non mode, I can just even fire up Ranger, right? But when I do the iteration, I would have to somehow also unwind what Ranger thinks it has for state. That's going to be more difficult. So, yeah. And it's, it's, it's always bad if you have the, the weaker mode do more than the stronger mode. So that's, yeah. And there, then there are, there, there's a pending change that I actually reviewed this morning on the bus, at least uh, offline, so I didn't send out a review yet, uh, to add even equivalence tracking in, in the same awkward way I did the predication, which I'm, try, I, I, yeah, I'm pushing this for like one and a half years now because I don't like how I did the predication. And so, of course, I don't really like to bolt even more on top of that. But yeah, so equivalence tracking is another thing that Ranger can do. But I would also need to see how that can be used, if that's useful or not. And, and I'm not sure. Yeah, you feel free to experiment. <laughs> now you know everything about value numbering. <laughs> so I think I only have one more slide. Yes. <laughs> Questions? And I think we are also out of time, right? Yeah. 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 Is there a last question? No? Then uh, thank you.